Hi there. So I'm uh, Andy Warman. I work for a company called Harmonic. Um, I'm actually presenting this on behalf of Simti. We're going to be talking about uncompressed video over IP. Um, if you're not familiar with uncompressed workflows, uh, this is the kind of technology that's being used in broadcast facilities, in studios, gets used for news production, all those lovely sporting events you like to watch on TV. Um, they're going to be predominantly based on uncompressed workflows, certainly at the sources for cameras uh, and production mixing and capture. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about a specific standard from Simti called Simti ST2110, uh, Professional Media over IP Managed Networks. Um, a little background though first on Simti. So Simti is the Society for Motion Picture and Television Engineers. Um, it's a professional body. Um, that is dealing with the advancement of technology for the entertainment industry. Um, they really do three main things. First of all, they develop um, standards that you're probably very familiar with. Even if you may not know what they are specifically, you are probably using some of these um, in your daily work. They also have a membership arm um, and progressively do more and more education. Um, so what do they do? Well. They're commonly known for things like Simti timecode, color bars, uh, things like the MXF media exchange format, and more recently, IMF, which gets used in post-production a fair amount. Um, but probably what they're best known for is something called SDI, or the Serial Digital Interface. Um, this is a coax-based connection method for moving uncompressed video, audio, and data in facilities. Basically what it is, is a single coax cable containing one video signal interleaved with audio and ancillary data. Um, and that ancillary data carries things like caption data, timecode information, trigger information for downstream systems to insert ads or replace content. Um, but the technology is getting quite old. Um, for example, the raster that gets used is based on CRTs. Right? It includes things like horizontal and vertical blanking. Um, so, here's the raster, um, and the reason I'm explaining this to you now will make a little bit more sense here shortly, but what you typically see is the active video, okay? So it's only a portion of the overall image. There's actually a lot of and, uh, blanking or unused space. Um, there's horizontal blanking and there's also uh, vertical, and in the horizontal we have audio, we have line and CRC data, we also carry sync signals, um, and last of all, vertical ancillary data, okay? So there's a lot of things going on, but there's actually quite a lot of unused space in the raster as well. Also, with SDI, um, there tends to be huge cross-point switches, or routers. Uh, by huge, I mean they're physically very big, uh, certainly when you compare it to IT infrastructure, and what we're used to using now. Um, they are physically very large, but they interconnect all the inputs and outputs for all the di different devices you want to use. This includes things like switches, which will do all your audio, video mixing and effects, devices for recording and playing back content, inserting graphics, adding captions, um, logo branding, and all, this other, all these other things as well. And a completely different system, which deals with synchronization so that we actually have frame alignment uh, that's all based on analog. Uh, the reason we do all these things is because we need a very, very low latency real-time system with the best possible video quality that we can get, uh, particularly for live productions or when we want to capture content for playback later in the absolute most pristine video quality we can manage. And typically this is the sort of thing that you'll see in sporting events, uh, when you watch the news, when you watch your favorite, favorite episodic content, it will have been captured with SDI-based technology. So why do we want to go to IP? Well, IP has got some definite advantages over, over the SDI infrastructure. First of all is density. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that here shortly. It's also format agnostic. It doesn't really care what content or formats of, of, of content you put on it, uh, which is very different from SDI, which is very rigid about what it will carry. It's also very easy to integrate with PCs, so we can have more software-based solutions. And you can multiplex lots of different signals together. So things like timing information, video, audio, and data, 
the way that we can find devices that get uh, attached to networks, carrying things like real-time audio so that different people working in studios can talk to each other, and tally lights which tell a presenter which camera to look at in a, in a studio. Now, we talked about, I said I would talk a bit more about density. Um, this is what SDI cable looks like underneath the floor uh, in a typical broadcast facility. Oftentimes, many, many layers of cable which they never bother to remove, and it just piles up and piles up. Um, and that router I mentioned earlier, yeah, it's not very dense. Uh, several hundred connections there, taking up a huge amount of space, very difficult to wire uh, and manage. Now, when we go to IP, we want to take a different approach. In fact, we get many, many advantages by doing this. Um, sometimes it gets called virtualized broadcaster infrastructure or equipment, but really what we're talking about here is data centers. So how can we use data center infrastructure um, to move uncompressed workflows forward, make them more effective, make them more modern? Certainly we're going to get a lot of advantages by using IT technologies. It's going to be a lot more flexible, a lot more format support. We can use common off-the-shelf IT hardware, so switching, compute, GPU-based processing, all of those sorts of things. Um, and more and more software-based technologies can be used. We can also virtualize it, so it's not one device, one function anymore. Um, we're going to get a lot more flexibility that way. And also, it's a way to get us from fixed on-premise infrastructure to leverage more and more cloud-based infrastructure as well, it's effectively creating these hybrid workflows where we mix broadcast infrastructure with uh, public cloud. All right, another thing about density is that we can replace one cable uh, as opposed to having many different cables. To give you some sort of perspective on what that means in IT terms, a single 10 gig connection can carry about seven regular 1080i streams. 100 gig can carry almost 80. 400 gig over 300. All right, so that's a very big change from um, that picture you saw earlier where there was probably a couple of hundred connections on the back of that large frame, putting all of that down one fiber optic cable. Now, let's talk a bit more about the actual standard itself and how it compares and contrasts to using SDI and all of the issues we've already discovered. Um, the key thing about 2110 is that it's elementary flow based, meaning that the video, the audio, and data all flow independently over the network. Right? They're not tied together. In SDI, those three different components are actually interleaved with each other, which means every time you want to work on just the audio or just the video, we have to basically unpack all of that to get access to the video and the audio, or the data, manipulate it, then put it all back again. Because we're going to carry all those flows independently, we can actually independently interact with them and do certain parts of the workflow just on the flows that we care about. OK, another thing um, is that you know, we often get asked this, I, I work for a compression company, is you know, why would you use compressed versus uncompressed workflows? Well, this will give you an idea. I said earlier that the workflows we want to use uncompressed in for SDI and now IP need very, very low latencies. That's because we want push button type control. We want to be very reactive to what we're seeing on screen and we want what we want the viewer to see. Um, not a few seconds, but more like a few frames. All right, so when someone scores a touchdown, um, you want an immediate reaction, you want to be able to do the replay, you're going to need not just a few seconds, but a few frames to react and, and recap the action or uh, add graphics or whatever is necessary. So here's a simple chart. Um, don't don't uh, count on the exact gradient of the line. Your, your uh, experience may vary here with compression, um, just for illustration. But uncompressed sits right at the top, very low latency, but requires a lot of bandwidth. In the middle, we have iframe-based codecs. They give us visually lossless type compression, all right, but they still require a reasonable amount of bandwidth. And then what most people encounter, most consumers encounter, is lossy but high quality, highly compressed content. But the latencies there are very, very long. So you could see 
an interactive workflow becomes very difficult, particularly when we get down into these uh, uh, lossy and long latency uh, types of compression. So low latency, uncompressed, is not just good for quality, but also interactivity. So that's where 2110 sits. All right, it's sitting right there up in high bandwidth, um, low latency. And there are five main parts of the standard. Um, I'm going to talk about each one of these in more detail here in a minute. But they are basically part 10, which deals with system timing and definitions. Part 20, which is the uncompressed video. Uh, part 21, which deals with something called traffic shaping and also delivery timing over a network. Uh, then we have PCM-based audio. And last of all, we have transport of ancillary data. There are also two other parts that are fairly popular which deal with compression. I won't get into much detail, but I will make a brief mention here. That's part 22, which is light compression of the video, so the active video. Um, there's no defined codec for this, but basically you have really two practical choices. One is called VC2. Uh, the other one is the newly minted JPEG XS um, that does line-based compression. And then the other part is compressed audio. Um, gets used quite a lot, uh, is part 31. That's how we can carry things like DTS AC3, Dolby E, AC4, right? Those kind of uh, types of compression that are common to broadcast set-top boxes, that sort of thing. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper. Uh, part 10, system timing and definitions. Um, there's three pieces to this. First one deals with the network interface. Um, so it's obviously IP. Um, we use RTP, real-time protocol, uh, and UDP. Um, the timing model is based on PTP. All right, so the whole system actually depends on PTP with a common clock. Um, in practice, these systems tend to have more than one clock, a master, and some other slave-type clocks. Uh, in case there are issues on the network, we can switch between clocks. Um, and then the standard also defines the relationship between the PTP time and the RTP timestamps. Okay, so as signals progress through the network, we're actually carrying two timestamps, um, the origin and also uh, the timestamp for the device you're on currently. Um, and then we also define what the, what the meaning of the timestamp is. So the, the easy example here is a camera. It's going to define its time as when the image time or time of capture was, right? So what the exact time code was when we captured that particular image. The third part is the SDP, or Session Descriptive Protocol. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this because of uh, uh, use of video uh, streaming in other applications. Um, it gets used here as well. So the Session Descriptive Protocol, typically there may be one or more than one of these files per device. Um, but in this context, they define each of those three flows we talked about earlier. The video flow, okay, which has got a multicast address, a port, and a payload defined. The audio, um, which also includes that plus the number of audio tracks that we have. And the third one, which is ancillary data, uh, for carriage of, uh, of the additional data, caption data, etc. cetera. Um, and you're gonna need this file for many things, but one of the key things is to allow you to join the multicast address. This system is all multicast based because we want all signals to be routable, right? We want to create routes between inputs and outputs anywhere on our, on, a, on our network. And the SDP file gets used for this so we can understand where all the different devices are connected uh, and make sure the flows uh, can make their way through the network to between the source and target device. All right, second part, part 20 uncompressed video. Um, this is actually based on RFC 4175, um, and it only carries active video. So remember earlier when we looked at the raster, there was a whole bunch of blanking, unused data space, basically. Um, RFC 4175 and 2110 part 20 only carries active video. We ignore all the rest of it. Um, it's also got a very large raster, 32 square, 32K, sorry, square. 
all right? Very large. So future proofing is built in. Colors cover, carry, sorry, all the colorimetry information and gets you a lot of flexibility on sampling. Now, most workflows in broadcast at least are 422 10-bit, but you have flexibility to go 444 16-bit and beyond. The last thing it does is it also defines the use of high, dy high dynamic range as well, so we have flexibility uh, there as well. Um, it's pretty open-ended on the types of HDR we can use, but basically PQ, PQ and HDL are sort of the default. Um, earlier, I gave you some numbers for 1080i carried over 10 gig, 100, and 400 gig. Um, if you were to try to do this with UHD, you could see why SDI is not going to work for us. Right? The amount of data required to carry HDI is huge. Basically, um, the way SDI is defined today, the largest size is 12 gig. You could only do UHD 1 at 50, huh, 50 frames a second, right? Makes it pretty much useless. So IP has a real value here because we can effectively use IP networking to scale to any size UHD and most practical levels of sampling. All right. Admittedly, when you get into 120 frames a second, um, that means you're going to be using very large pipes, but at least it's possible in IP, which it certainly is not going to be in SDI. So we've got a huge amount of future proofing built in by going IP. All right, next part is PCM audio. Um, this is based on another standard called AES67, which in turn is based on RFC 3190. Um, this, rather like video, has a whole bunch of options for bit depth and sample rates, but in most workflows, certainly in broadcast, it's 24-bit, 48K. Um, and audio tends to be eight or more channels uh, per flow. You can have multiple flows for audio, um, meaning that one video may actually be related to multiple flows of audio with eight or more channels each. Um, that means we can do things like 5.1, 22.2, surround sound, we can carry descriptive audio, we can do multilingual audio support as well, and we can do all of those things um, tied to a single video stream, which, again, you can't do with SDI. All right, so another problem, or, or, or we should say we found a solution for um, deals with packet inter-arrival inter time. So um, I have some an inputs and outputs, and I have data flowing over the network. On my output side, I'm going to be caching or buffering data. Okay, um, And in a, in a normal world, what would happen is that the input would progress at a constant rate. And if you don't control that constant rate, you know, if things were normal, that would be the way it work, would work. However, it's possible that things can go wrong um, if you're not paying attention, and you're not going to get traffic arriving on the input consistently. So what happens? Well, things build up, and we're going to get a whole burst of data that on the output side we can't handle. right? It's going to build up to the point where, well, the, pa the, the pipeline breaks down. So there is a solution for this. Um, it's 2110 part 21. Uh, that's the traffic shaping. And that actually defines how to consistently deliver the, net the data over the network so that we don't run into these problems. Uh, includes some flexibility as well. So for example, ASIC-based systems need pretty tight controls. Software-based systems don't, right? They can have a lot more buffering. Um, and so those, that kind of flexibility is built in here. Um, but this is a method for us to clearly state how to make sure that we get consistent data delivery, even though IP networks are not really deterministic per se. All right. Um, the last key part here is SIMT2110 part 40, all right, the carriage of ancillary data. Um, here, what we're doing is we're carrying the timecode information. Um, we've got closed captions. We've got SCTE 104, which 
Once it runs through encoding, we'll end up as SCT35, and that's what's going to trigger all your downstream adverts and everything else. We probably heard from um, Zach earlier on. Um, and a lot of other information, things like defining what aspect ratio is applied to the signal so that downstream devices can do aspect ratio conversion and a whole bunch of other things as well. All right, so this standard, 2110, is actually quite new. It's really only been around a couple of years. Um, and a lot of it's been driven by the vendor community um, because we know that 4K, 8K, et cetera, are gonna become more and more popular over time. Um, 4K has been standard in a lot of production-based environments for many years. Uh, and people are looking for cost savings and simplification as they scale out and do more and more production content creation. Obviously, content creation is, is growing rapidly still. Um, and IP is a great way to, to solve that. There are a lot of real-world impl implementations of 2110 already, however. Um, a lot of these uh, end users, I'm not sure if you can really see, see, read them too easily, but a lot of these end users were pioneers in their countries of this technology. But there are now hundreds and hundreds of deployments based on the 2110 standard. All right, thank you very much.